welcome and good evening, uh, guests, students, faculty, alumni, colleagues, and friends. Thank you for joining us uh, to this event uh, for our New York Institute of Technology School of Architecture and Design. On behalf of uh, our Dean, uh, Maria Pervellini, Chair Giovanni Santa Maria, and the Lectures and Events Committee, I would like to welcome you to this Lectures and Events series for the spring of 2021 semester. My name is Pablo Lorenzo Iroa. I am the chair of the Lectures and Events Committee and associate professor at the New York Tech School of Architecture and Design. This uh, semester theme is Correlational Crisis. 2020 marked a critical year in which environmental, health, economic, and social crises uh, had become correlated, uh, bringing forth the emergence of unforeseen global issues to be addressed with certain sense of urgency. The Spring 2021 Lectures and Events Series at the School of Architecture and Design at the New York City of Technology creates opportunities to discuss how architecture, design, and urbanism can disclose implicit parameters and activate structural transformations in our ecological, social, and built environments. From how reality is measured and validated to automation and computational thinking, the series aims at questioning the possibilities for disciplinary action. Today's event uh, theme is uh, what are the possibilities for a critical computation? And the title uh, Designing Architectural Research is related to an exhibition which uh, we are seeing now uh, some images of uh, at our School of Architecture and Design at the New York City of Technology. Uh, this event celebrates the launching of two new Masters of Science programs at the School of Architecture and Design. Uh, the MS in Architecture, Computational Technologies, and the MS in Architecture, Health and Design. Both programs were conceived by our Dean and Professor Maria Pervellini after an important grant from the IDC and were co-developed by Professor Tom Berberes and myself, who I'm going to be working as a director of the MS in Architecture, Computational Technologies, uh, which both programs are starting in the fall of 2021. The Masters of Science in Architecture Computational Technologies has a distinctive approach to the relationship between emerging technologies and architecture culture. The program will aim at activating an architecture of information by expanding design authorship to develop new systems of representation instead of just simply using the latest available technology. The program will have three parallel areas of focus conceived to develop design innovation in computational technologies, robotics, and materials. In the focus area of computational design, the program will explore frontiers on artificial intelligence, but also do research, analysis, and development of new algorithms and platforms. In the focus areas, robotics and fabrication, the program will explore interactivity, augmented reality, and will also do research on robotic fabrication, including the development of new robotic systems. In the focus areas, material, uh, the program will do research on innovation of uh, materials, robotic materials, biomaterials, and others. I will let now my colleague uh, uh, in this endeavor, Professor Tom Berber, is introduce the MS in Architecture, Health, and Design program. Um, sorry. Give me... Uh, Yes, you, you can hear me. Sorry, I was looking yes. at the mute yes. button. Um, thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, I'll introduce the MS in Health and Design, maybe about the ambition to launch the program, which concerns uh, consequences for designing for the well being of our spatial environments and its social order uh, and our bodies, uh, the relationship of our spaces to our bodies. Within the brief and transitory history of our cities and architecture, we can track the role of public health crises, uh, which have led to the successive reconfigurations of our architecture, our interiors, and our cities. The, the rather unforgettable year of 2020, uh, or perhaps forgettable, uh, depends on one's point of view. Um, uh, 2020 had created a lingering and sobering context characterized by multiple intertwined, intertwined crises. To be more specific of what uh, Pablo was talking about, of our global pandemic, our planetary ecology, social and racial justice, and economic equity. Uh, having been revealed is the correlation of these, uh, of the health of our bodies, the spaces we design, our cities, our society, and our planet as a whole. In the curriculum and specific syllabi of the uh, MS program in design and health in particular, which I had the honor 
to draft and redraft both um, both of these MS applications uh, together with Cardwell. Um, as, as comprising the application uh, uh, um, uh, and, and approval documents, let's say, I mean, these were syllabi that were written at, at that stage, we captured a zeitgeist, if you can say, of, at the intersection of health and design. Uh, that zeitgeist uh, captured in time in 2018, 2019. Uh, credit to our dean for her foresight and determination to pursue uh, health and design MS program, of course, uh, regarding our computational technologies MS program as well. Uh, and I had recently reread several key syllabi in the MS program in health and design, really just out of interest, like where do they stand now? And although the content and the focus of our courses is uh, it's far from out of date or obsolete, and the pedagogy and research to be pursued in these in this particular program, has already surely been impacted by um, the, the ongoing global uh, health crisis, along with other ecological, social, and economic challenges. Now in 2021, soon entering a second year of the pandemic, many of the syllabi that I was reading speak to this time in which we could afford either greater idealism uh, about the intersection of health and design. Uh, but at this time, it seemed in this reading, uh, the research arena has accelerated and gained greater urgency and importance, much more than even when it was conceived. And one of the proofs of an academic program's pertinence is the rate at which a curriculum um, can change and keep up to its rapidly changing context. And of course, the context of our, uh, our global health context has uh, been transformed unrecognizably. So architectural design research at, at the frontiers, which we aim for, seek to articulate alternatives to the prevalent approaches to designing for the qualities of spaces for treatment and convalescence and recovery. And the pandemic, of course, has opened more broadly the possibilities of these alternatives of designing for our well-being. Technologies enlisted in the service of health and wellness include information-based computation, uh, data science, the scales of which can be defined as uh, corporeal, social, and planetary, shared research and pedagogic methods, including simulation of the performance of varied qualities of space, including health, uh, sorry, thermal comfort, um, ergonomic and occupational behaviors, uh, augmented and intelligent systems, new media of all kinds, uh, all those holistic experimental approaches to the wellness of our bodies and our minds. And designing for the affects of architecture, the moods and atmospheres we create as designers through sensorial and experiential media, uh, not only have uh, this visual, visceral, and immaterial properties, but are boldly uh, bodily and physical. Uh, together with the MS in Architecture and Computational Technologies, our Design and Health program shares a deep interest in material science and maker culture targeting the fabrication of spatial material and medical prototypes. Uh, and lastly, for my part of this introduction to this event, um, the ongoing pandemic, uh, sorry to go on about this, has necessitated the advancement of the theorization and methodological advancement of uh, what we could call a microbial scale of space, a scale which we cannot see, um, and seeking the impact uh, for the outcome of its architecture, interior spaces in the city, and irrevocably um, affecting domesticity, public life, work, leisure, and mobility. And experimenting at the forefront of speculative interdisciplinary practices in this realm, uh, in health and design and computational technologies as well, present an opportunity to update our worldview and our values, uh, and the focus and outcomes of the frontiers of architectural design research. Um, welcome to our speakers. We'll introduce you in a moment. I'll pass you back, uh, pass, pass back the, the mic, so to speak, back to Pablo, who will introduce our first speaker. Pablo. Um, well, before the, the generic introduction to each of the speakers, I just want to mention that uh, tonight's uh, event, uh, we're going to count with Konstantinos Daskalakis, Professor of the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the MIT, and member of the Computer Science and AI Laboratory. We'll then want to proceed to uh, listen to a presentation by Akim Menges, professor of the ICD, Institute for Computational Design and Construction, Cluster of Excellence, INT, CDC, University of Stuttgart. 
Then we're going to listen to a presentation by Rachel Armstrong, Professor of Experimental Architecture, School of Architecture Planning and Landscape at Newcastle University. And lastly, we're going to hear a presentation by Francis Vitonti, CEO of Lexet uh, Company. Uh, we'll then are going to have a moderation between uh, the presenters, uh, Tom and myself. And we're going to uh, discuss briefly the content of the exhibitions uh, design and architectural research. Uh, so I'm now, uh, Tom, if you can introduce just briefly the exhibition uh, uh, content, and then we proceed to the first speaker. Thank you. Um, the exhibition, which was intended to be an in-person exhibition, both in our Manhattan campus and uh, in our Long Island campus, uh, and was uh, first launched uh, last, uh, last fall uh, as an online and virtual exhibition, which we had a large uh, panel discussion, a really large uh, event, uh, inviting uh, many of the, or all of them, whoever could, could attend, of 20 exhibitors. So both in the categories uh, of uh, computational technologies and health and design, uh, there were 10 um, exhibitors in each. And so the exhibition is meant to uh, chart some of the, the work um, uh, and research in the field uh, and of, of uh, colleagues, peers, uh, doing admirable work, uh, which we uh, both value and, and, and thought it would be important to engage with and to invite people to um, directly. So this is the second event, uh, not, not the exhibition opening specifically, um, but a further follow-up for a launch of these two programs. Um, perhaps just briefly mentioning the list of uh, contributors uh, for the computational technologies. We have Andrew Sanders, Ecologic Studio, ECTCT, Future Forms, IGP Architects, Institute for Computational Design and Construction, Manuel Jimenez Garcia and Gilles Retzin, Material Topology Lab, Technion University, Matt Sist, Lake Flato, RSS LTD, Robert Stuart Smith, Suhi Min Ham, and Saha Adid Architects. For the health and design, we have Adams and Gilping Design Studio, Anonymous, Farnas Farahi, Bess uh, Krietmeyer, Erach Carvajo Architects, Lydia Calipoliti, Nicolo Casas and Anouk Wittenprecht, uh, Philip Ram, uh, Rachel Armstrong, Sean Lally, Six Trends, and Studio Vitonti. Uh, I'm going to now uh, proceed with the first uh, presenter this evening, Konstantinos Daskalakis who will present uh, how does machine learning fails and what can we do about it. Uh, Konstantinos is a professor of computer science at MIT working on computational theory and his interface with game theory, economics, probability theory, machine learning and statistics. His work has resolved long-standing problems about the computational complexity of Nash equilibrium and multi-item auctions and now focuses on high dimensional statistics and learning from biased dependent and strategic data. In 2018, 2018, he was honored with the prestigious Nevalina Prize by the International Mathematical Union. This prize is presented along with the Fields Medal for outstanding contribution on mathematical aspects of information science. He has been honored with several other prestigious awards, including the ACM Doctoral Dissertation Award, the Kalai Prize from the Game Theory Society, the Sloan Fellowship in Computer Science, the SIAM Outstanding Paper Prize, the Simon Investigation Award, the ACM Grace Murray Hopper uh, Award, and the Bodosaski Foundation Distinguished Young Scientist Award. One of the main reasons we wanted uh, to count with Konstantinos uh, in this presentation is not only his uh, eminence in terms of computer science, uh, and he's actually discovered some very famous problems uh, such as the Nash equilibrium, but also uh, perhaps uh, Konstantinos may help us lead the discussion in terms of what's going to happen with the biases in AI and how can we do, how can we move forward in architecture learning from uh, his experience and his leadership in the field. So welcome Konstantinos and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and thanks everybody for being here. Uh, so over the past uh, decade or so, we have seen some uh, impressive successes uh, in machine learning. And those successes are slowly but uh, increasingly uh, translating into uh, 
a practical impact. And um, I think it is important at this point to uh, do a little bit of introspection and understand the strength, but also the limitations of that technology. Uh, uh, as it, uh, you know, is uh, uh, in the brink of uh, influencing our uh, already has, but it's in the brink of uh, even more uh, uh, influencing our, our lives. So, um, and uh, yeah, so I'm going to do a guided tour into um, uh, modes of failure of this technology and the relationship of that to this fresco from Minon Crete uh, might become apparent, apparent at some point during the talk. So, uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, machine learning uh, has made some impressive, uh, really impressive successes uh, in the past decade. Uh, uh, in image recognition, uh, um, self-driving cars, and playing uh, at a human or even better level, some very complex games like Go. In uh, uh, speech transcription, uh, translation, and uh, as of more recently, uh, 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 text generation. But what I wanted to talk about is how what these successes really mean. And uh, uh, as an anchoring point, I want to first discuss a little bit the pipeline uh, within, uh, from which uh, all these successes arise. So the machine learning pipeline is to first pick an application, for example, uh, object recognition in an image, collect relevant data, that will help you get insights into how to solve this learning task. Uh, uh, you know, write down and train a machine learning model on your data to do well in terms of predicting objects in the in the, you know in the, in the type data you have collected, and then you know hopefully if your if your model is good, deploy it in the real world. Okay, and um, I want to talk a little bit about the relevant data. Uh, which is going to be the starting point of the issues that arise. Uh, so the data uh, must be representative of the conditions that your machine learning model, after being deployed, will encounter. Uh, and um, um, uh, that data should be viewed as uh, the training material for your model, in the same way that uh, a baby grows and uh, is presented with uh, various challenges and uh, has to develop uh, in, uh, um, uh, cognitive abilities to, to, to handle and tackle these uh, challenges. In the same way, our machine learning models are uh, um, 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 presented uh, data and they have to understand how to model this data to then and, and, and use their models to make prediction in, in future situations. So for instance, um, the way we proceeded for uh, image recognition is to collect a very, very, very large data set of images labeled with their contents. Okay, so that data set is called ImageNet. And then we started uh, writing down models that uh, whose accuracy in terms of predicting the contents of the images uh, were becoming uh, better and better and better and better. And at some point around 2014, 15, uh, the accuracy of our machine learning models surpassed that of uh, humans. So uh, this guy here is Andre Karpathy, who was at the time a graduate student at Stanford, uh, who sat down and measured his own performance in terms of predicting the contents of the images. And uh, the error rate was around 5% on himself and then tracked uh, how well uh, machine learning models do in the same task. And you know, around that time, at around that time, machine learning models were able to beat that particular human in that learning task, which is very impressive. Uh, but what does that really mean? So this is what I wanna talk about. And I wanna start with some uh, examples of uh, how this fails. And we know it, we already know it fails. We know that it works great on this specific data set for this specific learning task uh, of uh, image recognition, but we also uh, have understood over the years that uh, there are important uh, modes of failure, oops, of uh, 
uh, image recognition. So here's one. So the plot uh, in the previous slide was measuring the performance of models on a particular data set called ImageNet. Uh, and what we have observed is that if we create other data sets following the same recipe as the one that was followed to create ImageNet, and then apply our high performing uh, uh, models on the new data sets, we get a significant drop in accuracy. Right, so accuracy on this on ImageNet is you know less than you know five percent error. Once we move to data sets that are created in a similar way, except you know, you know, um, you know, playing around with the uh, light, you know, you know, like the pose of the object and you know the lighting of the objects and so on and so forth, that has a significant drop in the accuracy of the models, like forty percent accuracy drop. So that's one uh, example of uh, failure, but there is even worse and more uh, um, uh, worse mo mode of failure. So we have realized that it's very easy to fool neural networks, to fool these algorithms. And in this picture, I'm showing you different ways in which we can fool them. Let me just talk about this uh, video you see here, which was actually created by some uh, students at MIT, including one of my own PhD students. So what these guys did is they 3D printed a little turtle and they painted the shell of, a, of the turtle in such a way that the state of the art uh, uh, neural network uh, uh, image classifier, uh, as you see here, uh, and you know, from different angles, uh, recognize this turtle as a rifle. Okay. Uh, uh, over here, you see other uh, uh, other researchers uh, trying to fool neural networks by uh, by doing other things. Like uh, over here, uh, they're playing with the orientation of the picture, right? So, uh, so you know, taking this, you know, changing the orientation uh, makes the neural net believe that this is a mousetrap and this is an orangutan. Okay. Uh, you know, painting things over a stop sign uh, makes uh, the neural network think is a, is a, sport, a sports ball. And lastly, all these examples here are uh, uh, adding imperceptible noise to uh, an image to create a new image that is essentially to a human eye the same as the image you started with, except in all these, for all these images, the neural net says it's an ostrich as opposed to the real uh, content of the image. These are all examples. These examples are called adversarial examples. And these are examples where machine learning just fails to recognize what's in the picture, even though we thought by looking at image net performance that the accuracy is really good. It gets even worse when you deploy that technology in the real world. Uh, and, and this is uh, the content of this uh, important article in ProPublica uh, several years ago now. So as you may know, uh, uh, AI is used in the um, uh, judicial system uh, and the law enforcement system. And what this article was about uh, is the use of, the, of AI uh, to make pre-detention, uh, uh, pre-trial detention decisions. Uh, now the algorithm used for such decisions is trained on data collected uh, based on uh, uh, decisions made by judges. And uh, unfortunately, the data that is trained on is uh, biased because, because you know, humans are biased. And uh, as the article pointed out, it has uh, some uh, very alarming points of failure, like the example that you see here on the right, whereby two, uh, uh, two, uh, uh, two different people, uh, uh, were deemed to have different type, different uh, uh, risk, even though uh, the guy who was labeled uh, as a low risk person has significantly more prior offenses compared to uh, uh, um, uh, the person who's uh, 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 co co considered to be a high risk person. And, and that was purely based on the race of the individual. Okay, so that was very deeply problematic. And uh, my last example, and then I'm going to get into more a little bit of, of uh, sort of like a, offer a perspective behind why all these things are happening. 
Uh, and this is going back to an example I mentioned earlier. So as you know, AI is now can beat humans in very complex games like Go and poker. On the other hand, uh, they fail in other simpler games that you and I can play pretty well. And uh, the video you see here on the right uh, is showing a Waymo car that is trying to enter a highway, but which is being antagonized by human drivers. So much so that uh, it abandons the attempt, exits the highway and tries again. And my question is, how come machine learning models can beat humans in very, very difficult games that you and I, or most of us at least, cannot play super well, yet they cannot beat humans in other games that you and I can play reasonably well? What is it that makes a machine learning model play some uh, hard games very well and some easier games worse? Uh, and um, there are many reasons why machine learning fails. And um, these reasons are not well understood or else we would have better technology. But I wanna talk about a particular reason why machine learning fails. And I wanna revisit for that purpose, the pipeline, the machine learning pipeline I was talking about in the beginning. And in particular, think about the important challenge of collecting good data, representative data to train your model on. And I wanna argue that access to uh, representative good data is a really, really hard problem to solve, getting good data to train your model on. And I'm gonna talk about three uh, uh, reasons why data, good data is hard to collect. I wanna talk about three uh, modes of failure in the data collection process, which has to do with missing data, collecting incomplete data for your task, uh, data that has dependencies and peer effects baked into the observations that you collect, and data that has strategic phenomena underlying the data and baked into the data that uh, confuse uh, the learning process. And to be a little bit concrete while I'm discussing all these challenges, my running example will be one from uh, Another use, another recent use of AI in the real world, which has to do with algorithmic hiring. So reviewing uh, 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 candidate applications using algorithms. There are many companies that um, um, offer such uh, uh, services of automatic screening of resumes. So here's a list of uh, uh, some of these companies and how they base their, what they base their predictions on. So questions or videos or having uh, candidates play games and so on and so forth. And uh, 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 I want to have this as a, as a, as a running example of uh, uh, modes of failure that I'm gonna be discussing in, in, in the next few slides. And let me jump right into the first mode of failure which has to do with incomplete data. So back to my example here, uh, what, what one should appreciate is that uh, data that you use to train your algorithm is coming from some society, some particular company, uh, maybe a collection of companies or from research papers. Data that comes from the real world is very likely to be incomplete. All right, and if you train your model on incomplete data, your model is gonna be biased. And there are many reasons why your data is gonna be incomplete. Complete data, you will only find maybe perhaps under, if you collect them under lab conditions. But if you collect data from the real world, there are gonna be a lot of reasons why it's gonna be incomplete. Here are some reasons. First of all, society is biased. And because society is biased, it prevents some data that could have been realized from being realized. Uh, 
Another reason why data is going to be incomplete is that uh, uh, oftentimes when you design a data collection experiment or even a, a, an actual a lab experiment, um, uh, uh, some you may you may uh, bake into your design some systematic selection bias that may prevent you from collecting uh, uh, all the data that is that you could have collected. Then there are instrument errors uh, that uh, make you record incor incorrectly record the data that you are measuring, and then there are ethical or privacy considerations that constrain uh, you from using all of the available data that you actually have collected. And the issue is that incomplete data will lead you to biased models and predictions. And they may also, if you use your biased algorithms, may lead you to amplify the, 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 the data that uh, is biased uh, that you use. And this challenge is well known to uh, the physical, social, and life scientists and statisticians, but we have to do a lot more work to uh, uh, resolve these types of issues in the context of machine learning. Um, so let me give just a, you know, uh, um, one example where, uh, you know, that has been recently ob uh, uh, observed. And this is from a paper by Bulamini and Zebru from a few years ago, who tried how well image recognition, uh, so gender recognition software from uh, different companies who worked on different subpopulations of humans. And what they realized is that uh, 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 software was really good on white Caucasian subjects in terms of predicting gen doing gender classification, but it was uh, uh, worse uh, in darker uh, individuals and really bad on darker female individuals. And, and what is happening here is that uh, the training data that these models were trained on contained a lot more, uh, uh, you know, light uh, skin, uh, Caucasian uh, male uh, subjects. And as a result, the model didn't pay enough attention on the, or didn't have enough data on the uh, subpopulations that uh, it hadn't observed a lot. And uh, uh, it didn't pay enough attention. So, it, you know, its predictions were not reliable. So how can you get robustness to missing data? Uh, the, the question is uh, a question of extrapolation. How can you extrapolate from uh, observing parts? This is, a, this is a, a distribution, let's say, on a full data set. And, and this is only observing part of it, so conditional on some subdomain. How can you be robust? Like if you're only observing a subpopulation, can, how can you predict that there is another bump out there? It's a matter of extrapolation. And what goes, what is, hard with extrapolation is you don't know how to continue like various possible continuations uh, you know are plausible how are you going to select uh, on how to continue so robustness to missing data so extrapolation is a blasphemous uh, type of thing in statistics statistics is about interpolation not extrapolation but when we're dealing with incomplete data we have to be able to extrapolate to uh, uh, you know, parts of the domain that we haven't seen. So how do you do that? So this is one of the things that I'm working with my group. And uh, roughly speaking, the um, uh, mathematical phenomena that underlie this have to do with high dimensional uh, geometry and trying to understand, uh, trying to prove that sort of like uh, certain bad phenomena that happen in high dimensions are not too bad. So what are these bad phenomena that happen in high dimensions? Well, uh, high dimensional objects, high dimensional oranges, most of the juice is very close to the boundary. So like three dimensional uh, oranges have, you know, the, the juice distributed in the whole uh, volume in, like, uh, in the close to the center as well. But high dimensional oranges have most of the juice close to the boundary. And that relates very well with, uh, you know, uh, the difficulty in extrapolating. So you have to prove that uh, for the phenomena that are of interest to you, the juice is concentrated close to the boundary, but not too much. Okay, so this is impressionistically uh, what this has to do with it. In any event, I wanna uh, wrap things up and I haven't talked about the other module failures. So let me just uh, do a, 
uh, a fast review of those. So the other mode of failure I was talking about has to do with dependencies and herding and peer effects. And coming back to my algorithmic hiring example, uh, here what's going on here. What's going on here is that I, I would claim that it doesn't even make sense the, 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 just the posing of the question doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really make sense to make predictions about a single person based on their own features. And here's why. The reason this question doesn't make sense is that behavior of people is influenced by that of their neighbors. These are the so-called peer effects or spillover effects. And the problem with, problem with spillover effects is that uh, they may even propagate inside a network and create long range correlations of behavior, which have been observed in many uh, applications like criminal activity, welfare participation, school achievement, and so on and so forth. So as such, there is no such thing as making predictions about a single node in these networks. The situation is more akin to what's happening in statistical physics, uh, where microscopic interactions, particle interactions, lead to macroscopic uh, behavior, which in turn influences individual behavior. So you need to understand uh, a phenomena at various scales from micro to macro back to micro. And um, uh, I would claim um, that, uh, I claim uh, uh, that uh, we don't even have the right mathematical engine to be able to do machine learning to take into account this micro to macro to micro interactions. So finally, and I will wrap up, there are strategic manipulations that are baked into your data. And back to my algorithmic hiring scenario, if I know that you're using an algorithm to score my CV, then why wouldn't I try to change my features to manipulate your algorithm and give me a good score. And this is precisely what was happening, if you think about it, in this little turtle example, where uh, you know uh, the students, the MIT students knew that you're gonna try to recognize this turtle using a particular machine learning algorithm. And what did they do? They painted the shell of the turtle in such a way that the machine learning algorithm recognizes it as a rifle. Okay, so if I know what you're gonna do to score me, then I'm gonna to try to manipulate my feature to mislead you in my favor. So in other words, we shouldn't be thinking about machine learning as a single agent task. So we shouldn't be thinking about a single agent who's collecting data from their environment, processes it and develops a cognitive ability. We should be thinking about many agents that are interacting in the same environment, right? And uh, their interaction influences the state of the environment, the rewards that every agent receives and the decisions that they make. This is the, this is the framework within which we should be thinking about uh, intelligence, all right? And we're very far, we don't, have the, we don't have the mathematical and computational engine yet to be thinking about AI uh, in this multi-agent context. So this is briefly what I wanted to talk about. So again, AI has made lots of impressive progress in the past decade. And there is justifiable excitement about it. However, we shouldn't be fooled. A lot of that progress is exhibited in lab conditions uh, on benchmark data sets and in very close, very well-determined things like uh, you know, specific games with specific rules. But when we take this technology out in the wild world, lots of other issues come at play and we just are not prepared to deal with these issues, both mathematically uh, and technologically, but also as a society, like the legal framework and other, uh, uh, other uh, 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 important considerations come into play. So we're working on the technological aspect, but there are many other aspects and it will take a village to uh, address these challenges. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Konstantinos Daskalakis. Uh, that was really fun, uh, fascinating. For anybody who's joined late, uh, Professor Daskalakis is a mathematician uh, and not an architect. 
Uh, our next speaker, who is an architect, uh, is Ahi Mengis. Um, uh, professor Mengis is a registered architect in Frankfurt and professor at the University of Stuttgart, where he's the founding director of the Institute for Computational Design and Construction and the director for the Cluster of Excellence uh, Integrative Computational Design and Construction for Architecture, or IDC, uh, ICDC for short. Uh, in addition, he's been a visiting professor uh, in architecture at Harvard uh, GSD and held multiple positions, uh, other visiting professorships in Europe and the United States. Uh, he graduated with honors from the Architectural Association in London. I recall his project vividly and it influenced students uh, for, for years, years afterwards. Uh, the focus of Achim's practice and research uh, is on the uh, microphone. Thank you. The focus of Nathan Mengis' practice and research is on the integrative development of computational design methods, robotic manufacturing and construction processes, as well as the advanced material and building systems. His work has received many international awards. He's been published and exhibited worldwide uh, and formed part of several renowned museum collections, among others, the permanent collection at the Centre Pompidou in Paris and the Victoria Albert Museum in London. Uh, Professor Mengiz's presentation is titled Computational Material Culture in, Ar in Architecture. Welcome, Ahi. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to participate in this exciting event. So as mentioned, I will talk a little bit about our work on, um, I would say, a novel computational material culture in architecture. And uh, I think with that work, we try to address, um, let's say, uh, two situations that we are currently facing. Let me just see how I get my presentation to run so perfectly. Um, so I think we are at um, the brink of uh, a situation, we, we are actually in a situation where, while we're currently experiencing, as it was mentioned multiple times, uh, a health crisis, in our human society, we're also experiencing uh, a severe health crisis of the planet. And we must not forget that building and construction is one of the major contributors to that crisis. Um, so the way we have actually dealt with uh, materials in creating the built environment in which we spend more than 87% of our time um, is actually becoming a, a real issue and there is a, a real need and urgency to rethink this situation. And I think especially we as architects are um, face a special responsibility in doing so. I think on the other hand, we're also in a situation where uh, computation as was uh, vividly shown just before uh, becomes more and more powerful, uh, but needs to be seen critically at the same time. Um, and we are working on investigating um, what the relationship between computation and materialization is and how that can be uh, a driver in actually um, looking at an emerging novel material culture which addresses um, the situations that I just mentioned before. Um, I think one of the problems um, when we begin to introduce computation um, in our field is that we tend to look at it uh, incrementally. So we look at design methods, or we look at engineering optimization, we look at uh, digital fabrication and increasingly also computation construction. Um, we look at new material systems that may emerge from that. But what we are trying to do is we're trying to look at all these things together at the same time and in feedback with each other because otherwise we tend to actually use digital technologies for pre-digital approaches and uh, more or less seek automation or computerization, but we fail to tap into the real potential of what digital technologies can really offer. Um, one fantastic uh, model for in integration um, is something that we cannot find in the kind of history of uh, references of our own field, but in biology. Because in biology, you would never ever differentiate between how something is actually generated, uh, what it is, uh, and in what kind of larger systems it is embedded. Those things are always 
And here I talk about, let's say, for example, form, material, structure, and space are always inherently and inseparably related. What is also interesting is that biology is a paradigm where actually resources have always been scarce and materials have hardly ever been wasted, which is very different um, to our field, where actually um, in the, for the sake of economy, we tend to waste materials um, in construction. So I think, uh, and I cannot say better than it is one of my favorite quotes here, in biology, material is expensive. Um, and that means expensive for the organism to produce, um, but shape is cheap. As of today, the opposite was true in the case of technology. And I think uh, what we are trying to seek is a situation uh, where digital technologies can uh, help and contribute to invert that. Um, we've done that uh, through an extensive uh, study over the last uh, 10, 12 years, uh, looking at various uh, digital models and various modes of um, integrating um, design, fabrication, and construction with material being one of the drivers. Um, and I just want to give you um, two examples of how this can happen tonight. Uh, one is looking at uh, one of the oldest construction materials that we know, namely timber. And how even with this sort of uh, um, ancient material, we can actually create novel structures and novel spaces through such an integrative approach. So this is something that I will try to show along two projects. One was actually the result of a larger EU funded research project into robotic uh, timber construction um, that we completed already in 2014. Uh, where we looked at the relationship between this material, which is actually really complex because it grows as the natural tissue of a tree. Um, and then we have to deal with it. And it's very different from uh, materials that are produced specifically for the construction sector, such as glass, steel, or concrete, and how we can relate that um, to computation design or body fabrication. Through that, we actually developed a new timber structure system, which um, is based on the idea that you embed all the intelligence at the joints where elements meet. Um, and you don't use an extra material element to do so, but you embed all that into the element that you deal with, in this case, actually the timber blades. Um, and uh, of course, robotic um, fabrication is the enabling technology to do so, especially with robots that self-compensate for path devi deviation and can ensure the accuracy that you need in order to create such false and form-fitting joints, as you can see here on the right. What is also interesting is that uh, we didn't find many precedents about plate shells, if you may call it like this, um, but uh, in nature there are fantastic examples like the plate skeletons of sea urgence that form stable structures even under severe forces and are, if you zoom in to one of the plate edges of these polygonal plate skeletons, connected by um, the biological equivalent of the kind of robotically fabricated finger joints. So um, this is governed by a lot of uh, different what we call to, uh, like to call biomedic rules, um, which we investigated with uh, biologists from the University of Tübingen, and which we embedded into an agent-based um, design system that on the one hand ensures compliance with those biomedic rules, but on the other also um, allows to deal with um, the aspects that we usually need to deal with in uh, architecture, such as structure, um, life cycle analysis, life cycle costing, is aware of the fabrication constraints and still allows for designer interaction. I think that's a critical aspect that it's a human machine interaction and not a design automation. Um, once this is done, um, the data is more or less directly fed to the machine and you get a building that you can assemble like a three dimensional puzzle in space where all the pieces are different. And because of that, you get a high performance uh, structure which is actually fully exposed as the architectural surface on the inside. So what you see here is actually the load bearing system um, that is only 50 millimeter thick and means that you can construct this entire space, which contains more than 605 cubic meters of space by just using 12 cubic meters of material. Um, in other words, um, 
it is a very high level of material efficiency, um, very lightweight construction. If you compare it to the an eggshell um, in re relation to its span, and you know, although we're scaling up, it's actually half the thickness. So for me, it's actually a nice example how you can reconcile sort of the very often, uh, um, I would say, rehearsed dialectic um, of efficiency and effectiveness versus expressiveness and um, evo I would say um, space system that evoke um, on many levels. Um, just to give you a sense of how we can advance that, uh, sometimes when we talk about timber construction, we hear, yeah, but timber is a finite resource because there's only a limited number of trees on the planet, um, supposedly um, based on some uh, uh, scientific papers, the, the amount of um, sustainable silviculture would actually be sufficient to house half of the world's population. So we thought, um, how can we actually um, make these structures um, double as efficient as they were five years ago in 2019 um, to see whether we can actually compensate for these uh, uh, resource, um, let's say, scarceness that even applies to this uh, renewable material. Um, there's something uh, we got the chance to demonstrate along this building that we constructed in 2019. Um, it's a research demonstrator that basically summarizes the, the, the next five years of research, um, which served as an event space, um, uh, a temporary structure um, that can be fully assembled and reassembled in a different space. Um, so really a circular building um, without any performance loss. Um, so our challenge was how can we build with exactly the same amount of wood per square meter, a structure that spans three times the length and uh, covers five times the amount of space. Um, I think here at the bottom, you can already see that we accomplished that. The Landesgarten show that I showed you before had an 11 meter span. It was weighing 36.8 kilograms per square meter. Um, then new shell spent 30 meters, which for any material is actually quite a considerable span and weighs just 36 kilograms. So this was achieved by actually, of course, advances in the computational design and uh, optimization tools that we need, but it was especially possible because we did something that we never do in architecture. We increased the complexity of construction in order to consume less material. So what was previously just one plate is now eight elements um, that form a hollow cassette structure that is actually stru structurally bonded together um, with glue um, so you could say, if, if you look at that uh, in our sort of day-to-day -day world, you would say you have made the, the, the problem eight times more complicated, um, but digital technologies allow us to compensate for that. And because I think really can question what is simple and what is complicated um, by developing actually a fabrication platform at the same time as we developed the project. So here you can see of how all these more than 370 um, individual plates can be automatically assembled. Um, so the glue is applied automatically. The pieces are secured with actually wood nails. Um, and then um, um, in the end, actually milled to the specific shape. So again, you get a structure that you can assemble for a span of 30 meters that does not need any scaffold allows us to go back to the traditional, very highly effective shell structures without the um, sort of usually involved uh, tremendous labor of building scaffolds and formworks. Um, and I think what is really nice to see is that that does not only register as I think a technical accomplishment, it also can be perceived as a kind of cultural contribution because that innovation is very, visible and creates quite an authentic space um, that was used um, extensively during this uh, um, one year event. I think it's also important to say that we always try to see how we can develop these things further um, in the architectural realm. So this is actually a competition we got second place for for an Dubai Expo Pavilion. 
uh, and it shows how um, even for much larger structures, this would still work as a kind of uh, circular structure that you could actually dismantle for an exhibition and bring to another place later on. Um, let me come to the second uh, case study, which is a bit more um, possibly uh, exotic for those of you who come from architecture and construction, um, because we're now dealing with a material that sits at the other end of the spectrum and is very rarely used in architecture. And these are carbon fibers uh, and high performance material that challenges our conceptions of what construction is, because a one kilometer of carbon fiber weighs less than one kilogram. Um, what is also interesting is that if we look into these kind of fibrous materials, we can see that in nature, almost all load bearing structures are actually made from fibers, collagen fibers, um, chitin fibers or cellulose fibers. Um, and uh, in that way, we can actually borrow a lot of, or we can actually transfer a lot of morphological principles from nature into um, fibrous structures in architecture. This is something I want to quickly show you um, along the exa also two examples. One is the uh, elytra filament pavilion that we constructed um, basically synthesizing a lot of uh, very, or various research projects for the Victorian Albert Museum, which is more or less a kind of canopy that covers the uh, courtyard of this museum, which um, is uh, uh, visited by more than 4 million people a year. So for that, we could actually tap into um, research that we had done previously on one of the most high performance natural fiber structures we know. And those are the four wings of flying beetles, which you can see here in the circle, um, which are made from uh, a composite um, of chitin, uh, fibers that are embedded in protein um, matrix. And what is particularly interesting is that also here, um, nature challenges our conceptions about structures where the double shell that we see here, this is a cross section through the beetle shell, um, is actually made from one continuous material. The fibers are continuous between the upper surface and the lower surface of the shell. And through that, it can become so incredibly lightweight. So we transferred that um, to actually a technical element or a kind of architectural element where the carbon fibers continuously without any actually uh, discontinuation um, oscillate between the upper and the lower surface of the structure. And we co-designed a robotic fabrication process with it that allows us to build these pieces. So here you can see that. Um, those are the elements, they're all different. They're all adapted to their specific location. And we can all build them with one tool. Um, of course, that involves actually quite uh, um, serious uh, computation. Um, this is the tool, it's a steel frame that can be reused, folded together like an umbrella, taken out. And on that tool, we actually lay the wet um, glass fibers that you can see here. So they're saturated resin, they're laid onto the structure, then they cure. And once they're cured, they're actually stronger and stiffer than steel relative to their weight. Um, once we have the body, which is basically the equilibrium state of all fibers in tension, we can lay um, the carbon fibers onto that glass fiber body and they form the actual structure. So here you can see a finished element. So the metal frame is taken out, used for the next element. Um, and an element that is uh, uh, about five square meters uh, big weighs only um, between 30 and 80 kilograms. What is also interesting is that if your construction site is a robot and a bucket of resin and a spool of fibers, you can begin to think about local production. You can, do think, you can think about uh, structures that challenge our conception of a design phase of a construction phase, of a use phase, and of an end of life phase. And all of this happened in this pavilion at the same time. So the pavilion kept on building itself while it was already there and visited and inhabited um, and changed throughout its lifespan. Um, and keep in mind that the entire system was only made from fibers. There's not a single piece of steel in this entire 200 square meter roof, which was weighing around nine kilograms per square meter which means that it's about um, 200 times lighter than the adjacent 
masonry walls and masonry structures of the Vienna Museum. Um, in addition, I think again here form, structure, fabrication becomes inseparable and there's no other let's say method than dealing with this um, than this kind of co-design um, integrative approach that we try to develop. Um, just to wrap up, um, again, uh, several years later, we had the chance to uh, complete this on a larger scale. Um, this is the, also the same, actually, um, Bundesgartenschau, uh, but a very different purpose here. It's in basically a maximum transparent shelter for an exhibition piece at the center, um, a dome that is about uh, 25 meters in diameter, um, houses this exhibition that was not designed by us um, with a structure that is only made from fiber. So again, not a single piece of steel uh, in the system. Um, here you can see the fabrication process. For this, we actually simplified the tools even more. So you now have only this kind of winding points at the two ends in an adjustable um, tool. Um, so none of the material is wasted. You use every single millimeter and um, there's no production waste. You don't need a mold. Um, the, the entire form of the elements is found as the equilibrium of the fibers. So here, again, you need to have a highly integrative approach to the uh, computation design, engineering, and fabrication to enable a truly novel tectonic system, I would say, um, that I would argue wouldn't have been possible to build um, five years ago. Um, it's extremely lightweight, can be assembled in less than a day. Um, in the end, it's sort of equipped with a transparent skin um, and allows the visitor to somehow experiences, experience this, um, what we like to call a truly digital um, building system um, and sort of its architectural qualities that somehow communicate to you how it works, although you may have never ever seen something like this before, because, because you get a sense that the black fibers seem to do the work, the white fibers, which are the glass fibers, create the shape um, and all this in a way that <clears throat> you can experience this um, and appreciate it as a piece of architecture that may signal um, or allow a, a glimpse of the novel material culture that we try to uncover. Um, there's also something we're now beginning to transfer into the built world. This is a building um, that we will complete uh, actually next year, where we have um, a, an entire um, building envelope made from a very similar um, building system. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope I didn't stretch the time too much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Achim. That was really, really fantastic to see your, your especially your, your later work. It's really, really great conversation starter for later. Uh, I hope we can keep you awake, given that you are in Stuttgart uh, six hours later than we are. Um, our next uh, speaker, uh, Rachel Armstrong, who is a professor of experimental architecture at the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at Newcastle University in the UK, and also visiting professor at uh, KU uh, Leuven, uh, uh, a senior TED fellow and Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, uh, Rising Water Two uh, Confab fellow. She holds a first class honors degree with two academic prizes from the University of Cambridge at Girton College and a medical degree uh, from the University of Oxford at Queen's College. Um, Professor Armstrong was admitted to uh, uh, as a member of the Royal College of New Zealand General Practitioners from 2005 to 15 and awarded a PhD in 2014 from the University of London at the Bartlett uh, in architecture. Uh, she's author of, um, uh, uh, I need to hold this up now, uh, The Art of Experiment Post-Pandemic a little bit of reflection. Uh, Post-pandemic knowledge practices for 21st century architecture and design uh, co-authored with Rolf Hughes. Uh, I was chewing through this on the weekend uh, in preparation for tonight. 
Um, and also experimental architecture prototyping the unknown through design-led research in 2019, uh, liquid life on nonlinear materiality in 2019, soft living architecture, an alternative view of bio-informed design practice in 2018, amongst many other titles. Uh, Professor Armstrong's lecture is titled Microbial Architecture and the Built Immunity and Built Immunity in the Urban Environment. Welcome, Rachel Armstrong. I need to unmute. <laughs> Thank you so much for the uh, introduction there. Um, I'll just pull up my screen. Okay, um, let's just uh, get the slide started. Okay, um, well, about a year ago, um, I, I was uh, in New York in person, um, yeah, meeting with uh, our fantastic hosts, uh, Tom and uh, Pablo, and uh, you know, really was on the tail end of a receding normality uh, just before New York became an epicenter for the coronavirus, both uh, in America and globally. Um, and I'm actually standing in front of, or sitting in front of a backdrop here that's um, by an artist, Helen Chadwick, who was one of the first artists that I uh, worked with. And this was in the late 1980s. Um, and it's called, it's part of the viral landscapes, which is an amalgamation of the landscapes in a place in England called Pembrokeshire, um, with samples of the artist's body, so kidneys and skin and other bits and pieces. And it became a collage and a fusion, um, an aesthetic, let's say, that spoke of, a, of, of an awareness of viruses um, in the wake of the AIDS pandemic. So um, what viruses are uh, extremely present um, and we tend to uh, want to get back to some kind of normality and maybe that normality is the presence of microbial others all around us in our cities. And tonight I really want to talk about um, these microbial others. Um, and I think that, um, you know, 2020 uh, created the moment when we can no longer think of microbes and these uh, non-human events being something that happens to uh, other people elsewhere, that they have actually breached our indoor spaces. Um, and they've created an intensity of experience now um, through which the invisible details of our lives were play played out. These are a couple of uh, photos I took whilst I was uh, meeting Tom and Pablo this time last year. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've, we've become really, um, you know, intensely focused on um, our bodies in relationship to space, social distancing, mask wearing, elbow bumping, uh, distortions of a remembered reality uh, go on. So you know, what are these microbes and how did we get here? Well, in the 17th century, these little animalcules observed by Anton van Leeuwenhoek were actually a source of wonder. Uh, but by the 19th century, uh, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch had identified them absolutely inseparably with disease. So from this came our reign of hygiene, where designs such as the U-Bend toilets, sewage plants, um, and modern white tiled, white clean bathrooms, along with a host of toxic cleaning products, proposed we would go to war with microbes and wage war, we did. By the 1960s, Rachel Carson's observation of a silent spring brought to public attention that something about the way we live is wrong. Advances in the late 20th century gave us a new perspective of the invisible world of microbes through the advent of genetic technologies that not only allowed us to see what microbes do on the inside, because morphologically microbes have about three different forms, but inside they are worlds in themselves. And so late 20th century, early uh, third millennial technology is not only showing us this complex world, but also how they form 
ecosystems. And so this picture that we've obtained starting at the beginning of this millennium confirmed that the majority of microbes, something that was known in the 19th century, but something that didn't hit the headlines because we're anthropocentric, um, was that microbes are fundamentally world-making agents. Their incredible processing power and metabolism offers a way forwards for addressing individual human impacts through the way we imagine not just our city spaces, but our homes and our environments. But how do we get from plague to a re-enlivened world? So firstly, I think it's important to point out that microbes are not separate from us, they're part of us. And again, you know, very early in the, well, just at the turn of the third millennium, the human microbiome was uh, identified and it deeply complicated our relationship with the microbial realm. Secondly, as bodies with microbes, which we now are, we are vectors and we spread them everywhere to the point that even our buildings and the urban environment has their own microbiomes. So we're, we're vectors within this incredible incredible uh, complex uh, landscape and we're disseminating and maintaining and participating in that. So what are, these, what are these creatures up to? Well, the majority of them are busy making soil oxygen and generally make the world livable. So when we create toxic environments, we tip the balance of healthy ecosystems and start to create disequilibrium. So microbes happily living within an ecosystem suddenly come into contact with us and with urban intensification, deforestation and the stress brought by industrialization are at risk of becoming deadly zoonosis. And we're seeing that more and more in late 20th century onwards. But most microbes, less, you know, more, more than 99% are environmentally beneficial. And so now that we can see them, now that we can see how they live, we need to ask how we might better live alongside them. So how do we do that? Firstly, we have natural systems that help us negotiate microbes and these are our immune systems. And according to Polly Matzinger's danger theory, which is a fantastic theory, it's a new theory in um, immunology, which says it doesn't talk about the self non-self, which is like alien and me. It talks about danger. In other words, the presence of harm in environments. So that when bodies or systems detect harm, they send agents to attenuate. So this explains things like autoimmune diseases, which is very difficult to explain with the self non-self model. Um, and actually creates a negotiating tactic to help us think about how we might design um, better livability in an age of microbes in both our homes and our cities, because those microbes that don't cause harm, we don't have to get out our dom domestics for, we can leave them alone so they can help you know, uh, clean the environment and uh, make useful things like organic, organic compounds, uh, which are in soils. Um, so in 2011, um, Philips, the lighting company, had a visionary idea, um, which at the time was entirely speculative. They imagined a microbial home um, that was powered by the activities of microbes, and they designed the apparatuses within a kitchen-based environment by which it might be possible to do this. So the idea was that by composting waste, um, that uh, comes from the kitchen and putting it into a different set of apparatuses, things like biogas, um, soils um, for growing you know, new vegetables and herbs uh, could be harvested. And they were actually quite creative about how they would harvest microbes. It wasn't just about fuel. They also looked at different lighting systems. They also looked at um, uh, bees and you know, how they might actually bring pollinators into this environment. But again, only 10 years ago, this was an entirely speculative proposition. But I'm now going to, um, uh, let's say, uh, invite you to think through how we might actually actualize this. Can we, um, let's say, follow Philip's vision and think about how we could strategically actually use microbes to carry out some of the things that they were uh, proposing? And so what we need to do is think about um, 
you know, what kind of a fabric um, microbes make. And it's really, the functional fabric is a biofilm. Now these aren't like tough membranes or anything. They're kind of like gel-like skins, let's call it. Um, it's a little bit like the, a thin skin on hot milk as it cools. That's like a biofilm. And they're very inclusive. Biofilms are not um, monocultures. Natural biofilms are made up of all different kinds of species. And as you can see, they spin these like uh, little soft cities, little soft worlds. Um, and so what we want to do is think about um, the particular qualities of microbial landscapes like this um, that provide us with a soft technology that might help us change the impacts of um, the way we live through the technologies that we use. Um, and so microbes are the world's best agents at metabolism. Uh, we think we're good at uh, being able to deduce metabolic networks, but microbes are the absolute masters. And they have given up a hard structure uh, at the, you know, they've, they've kind of given it up to God so that they can do transformation, soft stuff. They can live in any environment on, on this planet and transform that space into something that sustains them. That's a quality that I think you know, we're living at a time where we need to learn from. So how might we go about doing that? Well, um, again, uh, a bit like um, uh, Aki Mengus's work, mine was funded by the European Union, uh, which I love very deeply. Um, and uh, between 2016 and 2019, I proposed and coordinated this project called the Living Architecture Project. It was a six strong um, European team of partners. And essentially what we wanted to do was to figure out how we could actually design with metabolism using microbes as our partners. Um, and rather than starting, and we wanted this to be in a domestic environment, it was a scale that we thought we could manage. Um, but rather than designing the home for humans first, we thought we would design the homes for microbes. Now, this is how we kind of imagined it. We imagined um, uh, an environment powered by microbes weaning us off um, fossil fuels um, so that we could actually start to transform resource consumption. Uh, we could do this within an apartment space. So this was a way of looking at an average uh, you know, 2.2 uh, um, occupant family um, within a European city. And what we started to do, first of all, was think about um, some of the resource that we'd need. And this model is very interesting, designed by um, a liquid fur um, a systems group. And what it starts to show us is how much more water, how much more liquid we actually need in a living space if we're actually going to properly engage with metabolism, if we're actually going to um, you know, start to think about how we transform what we might call waste or you know, domestic product um, into something that we can recycle back into the system. So really this is just a sketch just to give us an idea about how space, how bathrooms, how these, how these liquids that we tend to not want in modern homes um, could start to move through cities. And essentially, it's asking for a, a 21st century notion of plumbing. So plumbing's really, um, you know, 19th century, you know, if we think of the, um, you know, the first sewers. Um, and it's really not been updated significantly since then. Um, and we need smarter systems, systems that can observe themselves. And I'm going to go on to tell you about how microbes um, that are strategically positioned within plumbing systems that produce electricity can actually start to create a kind of intelligence in dark spaces that would not be livable or likable uh, for, for people. So anyway, this is, this is a sketch and I'm now going to just um, start to um, just describe what this system is doing. So the system itself was about the size of a large bookcase and it's made up of three different types of microbial home. The microbial fuel cell, um, which is an anaerobic environment. So it doesn't need oxygen. Um, it's a bit like compost. It's not stuff that you'd want to look at. It takes slough um, and uh, it has a membrane in the middle and that creates um, uh, an interface that allows us to pull off the electrons from the electrogenic uh, microbes. So when they chew on the waste, they form this film on the membrane. 
and they poop micro, uh, uh, they, they poop electrons. So we pull those electrons off and we start to feed those back into the system. So those are electrogenic. And we have a photobioreactor um, system, which is your typical algae, little green cows chewing on carbon dioxide, loving um, you know, ultraviolet light or certain spec uh, wave spectrums of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then we had a synthetic microbial consortium, which was about us thinking about how could we actually design metabolism? So we wanted some natural ones because we wanted to see what they did. But then we wanted to actually see just how far we could design and engineer a metabolism. So the kinds of products we got out of this system, which was based on household waste, specifically urine, grey water, uh, liquid stuff, <laughs> stuff that you'd normally put down the plug hole. And I always think that modernity ends at the plug hole um, because, uh, you know, there's a whole world of little dark creatures down there that just that, that will eat your domestics for lunch. Um, so um, uh, the kinds of outputs we get are bioelectricity, and that's a very, very interesting product that I might be able to talk about a little bit later. Um, cleaned water, um, waste removal, so uh, a reduction of complex organic um, uh, molecules into simpler molecules that can be metabolized. Biomass production, so the photobioreactor in particular is working the other way, taking carbon dioxide and knitting it into long strands. Neutralizing pollution, that stuff is great for some microbes. They like it as a, almost like a nutrient, um, particularly nitrous gases. You know, nitrogen is something that microbes really want to make proteins. Um, and also reclaiming phosphate, another one of those, you know, vital elements for making bodies. Um, microbes can um, reclaim that um, from, from the waste. So we did part of this um, with uh, natural microbes and part of it with synthetic microbes. And here, are, oh, I don't know if I should move my little you know, thing around so you can have a look at the tiny little homes we made for them. They're a little bit technical here, um, but this is what the, um, these are the inner worlds of these different homes, let's call it. This is a little home for microbe. And the reason for designing that home that way is by, by structuring space and material, we can encourage microbes to perform certain kinds of activity. So essentially these are microbial affordances and we can exploit those affordances by um, uh, connecting our own apparatuses to them. So this is another one, again, a very much more simple space, the, the uh, let's call it a farm-like landscape in which little green cows eat their lunch and turn it into long cellulose-like molecules. Um, and then the synthetic microbial um, consortium, very, very interesting. This was actually a hack of this one. Um, so the microbial fuel cell has been around since um, uh, 1911, was actually invented at Newcastle University by a guy called Potter. Um, and this two chamber environment is really cool because it allows two different microbial worlds to talk to each other. So I'm just going to quickly take you through this. This just looks incredibly technical, but it's really quite simple. Um, it's actually a cross between these two. Um, so what we've got is what we, what's called a farm module. So we've got a, a membrane like in the, um, like in the battery here. Um, on one side, we have microbes that produce a lot of sugar. So this is Charlie and the Chocolate fam Factory. They produce highly um, uh, kind of energy containing molecules. These diffuse through the membrane and they go into the labor module. Now the labor module doesn't need light like the farm module. And what's in there are microbes that we know the genes of. And when we know the genes of, we can start messing around with the genes and we can think about how might we be able to create new genes. Now, what's interesting is that these two characters won't work together in nature, but if we feed them enough sugar, they will. And not only will they work together if we feed them enough sugar, we can get them to swap genes. So we actually build in a kill switch because if these guys get loose and they're genetically modified, they're not in a sugary environment and they're not living together anymore. So it stops the, um, the uh, let's say the synthetic genes being switched on. But that's just a, a, a little overview as to kind of, you know, what we were trying to do. We had lots of different kinds of bricks that, you know, or containers, you know, what was the best kind of house. In the end, we went for cheapness and efficiency rather than beauty. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, this was actually based on a, on a vernacular brick, um, four chambers, uh, three membranes, 
and uh, three different microbial populations kind of being, um, uh, let's say, uh, nurtured in these brick-like spaces. Um, so they're little stomachs, really. Um, and, and this is what a system looks like. Um, it's quite, it looks complex, it's not really. These are the microbial stomachs. So by sequencing the different microbial populations, feeding them with food from the settlement tank, uh, breathing oxygen into them from the algae lungs, because um, uh, uh, you know, there are microbes in the synthetic uh, consortia that need oxygen. And then these are kind of the poop tanks, um, you know, where we collect sediments we want, feeds um, stuff back into the system and then uh, you know detoxify and excrete stuff in the in the yellow chambers down the bottom so um, the the system is designed for a household it starts to look a bit like this um, and we took it into the world into um, the kind of smallest possible apartment space uh, in a collaboration with uh, an artist Cecile B Evans um, called 999 years, 13 square meters, the future belongs to the ghosts. And essentially what you're looking at is a post-human household. It's a 13 square meter apartment, which is the smallest legal saleable unit of occupied space you can get in London. 999 years is the longest possible lease. The future belongs to ghosts is the digital works of uh, Cecile. Um, which are being um, partly powered by the microbial fuel cells in this, um, uh, uh, let's call it um, a bedroom or a living space. Um, they are the only occupants of the space other than the digital ghosts. So it talks about the humans of the past, present and the future. But every week we would have to feed the microbes with like a, a baby food um, in the top tanks. Um, we couldn't use urine and wastewater because there's a Jackson Pollock collection somewhere underneath the floor around here. Um, and then we had to collect it in the, um, the collection chamber down here about a week later. So it was, it was actually a metabolizing system. Um, and, um, you know, the, it was a, 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 an interesting collaboration, but I, I just really like the idea that we were creating spaces for, for now no longer um, human uh, uh, populations. But I quickly want to talk now about what changed since last year um, with the uh, coronavirus. How might um, you know, us designing with microbes actually help us navigate this, this uh, let's say pandemic space, the plague space. So just remember um, our cities are actually microbial landscapes anyway, microbial cities, microbial landscapes, microbial bodies. Um, we can't see them entirely. We see them indirectly. We see the effects of their presence, um, fertile soils, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, marks on buildings where they settle in particular niche. Um, but you can just see that there are lots of different microbial worlds in an urban landscape from the rhizosphere and the bulk soil um, microbiome to the microbiome of the built environment. Um, so, um, what happened during uh, coronavirus? Well, um, uh, there was a lot of survey of trying to figure out just how many people actually had coronavirus because not everybody had symptoms. So, um, uh, you know, uh, pe uh, people were actually, you know, city councils were looking down in the sewers to try and take random samples and figure out um, from the presence of the coronavirus just how much of the population was infected. Well, what's interesting about digging into sewers to figure out our collective health is that the um, living architecture system is like a mini sewer that's um, in our household. Um, it has a regenerative sewage processing plant in those little stomachs, um, but effectively is getting contaminated by our own human microbiomes. And it's actually sampling, um, you know, the uh, microbes that are living on us. So it's actually primed to be able to look at our microbial health. And what's very, very extremely interesting about um, what we found, and uh, this was right before we, um, uh, you know, we, we, we were uh, running these experiments because we were concerned about synthetic microbes um, and we didn't really intend them to live in domestic environments. We were using them as 
um, ways of designing metabolism, hoping we could use those to try to screen for natural microbes in the future, create a library, for example, um, and then um, use natural microbes to create metabolic apps within our homes so that we could process our waste into all kinds of different products. Um, so one of the things we were trying to do was to create safety systems. And this was, um, I don't know if you can see, that the, I want you to see the credits here because this is work that was done at the University of the West of England. Um, but essentially an open system, run, uh, open waste run through microbial fuel cells leaves um, uh, uh, pathogens in the system. But when you close the loop, um, hepatitis B was one of the agents that was removed but effectively the microbial fuel cell is a microbial immune system. So the biofilm doesn't like pathogens and it's got technologies that are microbial, that are natural, that it uses to discriminate uh, about, let's say, um, new potential additions to the biofilm. So it's got a city with a defense system. And if those pathogens aren't ones they want, they get rid of them and you have to put it in a closed loop, but, but that's what happens. So this is really interesting for us because if we use microbial fuel systems in domestic environments and have closed loop circulations of our own waste, uh, not only could we build in biotechnology surveillance systems to monitor our health, but we could actually um, clean environments of certain pathogens. Now, I'm not saying it does coronavirus, we haven't done those um, tests, but it's very interesting to think that we might be able to pit microbial strategy against microbial strategy rather than human thought about how, how might we as humans get rid of the coronavirus? Yep, vaccine's great. Um, but, this, but anyway, this, this was a very interesting development because we could look back at some of the work that we've done and think about its relevance going forward. And the other aspect that we wanted to, to dig into was how we can better communicate with these microbes. I showed you the uh, work that we did with Cecile um, and you know, how we might have post-human households. Well, these post-human households are here living around us anyway. So why don't we actually figure out what's going on? So the ALICE project, the um, Active Living in in Infrastructure Controlled Environment Technology is an, was, a, was a proposal for an augmented reality experience, except the pandemic came and we couldn't build it. So we've had to do something that's um, online. But the idea is actually we use the um, electron streams from the uh, microbial fuel cells is data, live data, and we translate that into a bunch of software. Um, so Julie Freeman is the TED fellow, senior TED fellow, um, and data artist who started to visualize the different um, levels of electron production so we could actually see an overlay of the um, uh, the microbes inhabiting the, um, the, the living bricks, let's call them. So the question is, like, microbes are really tiny. We did something for the size of a house. Could that actually work in an urban landscape? Well, we think it can. And again, you know, work in progress. Um, but there's a wonderful company called Organica Inc. Um, based in Hungary, which deals with wastewater gardens that are situated in urban environments. And um, essentially they take they, they will take all kinds of liquid matter. So not just um, urine and wastewater, they'll take um, organic matter from humans um, and put them through a series of sedimentation tanks with different plants whose root microbiomes um, start to metabolize these different waste streams, leaving fresh, or not fresh water, cleaned water at the end, water that is clean enough to put into a river that, that will pass environmental safety standards. What we want to do is to take the microbial fuel cell and add that to the tanks so that we have gardens that are power plants and that produce bioelectricity. That's, that's how we're going to scale this. So we're going to turn our plants and water and soil making systems into um, electron generating systems. Now this isn't the 240 volt main supply that you get from the Volta-esque power uh, plant. We're looking more at a 12 volt lifestyle. 
So what we're interested in is low power electronic innovation. And for example, in the microbial, um, uh, in the living architecture project, we designed a robot that could run on the um, electrons from the living architecture project and it opened and shut a window. So it's quite a simple device but we want uh, low power robots, low power lighting. We're trying to think of an electronic landscape that's working on um, bioelectricity, not fossil fuel based levels. Um, so working with the kind of electricity that nature works with is an interesting proposal. And actually it's been running at Glastonbury for five years already. So this again is work by the University of the West of England led by Yanis Aropoulos and it's called P-Power. Um, they do work with um, Oxfam and the Gates Foundation. And essentially uh, these are pea harvesting units. Um, and uh, this is transformed into electricity for recharging mobile phones, which is you know, needed in the middle of a field um, for uh, charging um, uh, computer screens and also for playing computer games, which is the, the latest addition. So for, for those that don't want to uh, pogo or dance anymore, they can um, just sit down and relax with a, with a, a console. Um, so uh, as a group, again, you know, in Europe, um, we're looking at scaling bioelectrical systems. Um, so this is the Phoenix Cost Action Network. It's a group of or, uh, a network of uh, 32 um, different organizations around Europe. And we're all looking at how can we transform um, waste materials into bioenergy. So no, but bur the burning is through metabolism, which means there's a high efficiency of transformation. It means the metabolites that come out the other end are highly usable. So, um, so systems are starting to scale. We think that the applications are things like brownfield sites. The runoffs from brownfield sites could be metabolized by microbial bioelectrical systems, and that we could actually clean uh, soils in situ. Um, we think that there's urban retrofit here with things like the P-Power. It's not changing the infrastructure of cities or the city overall performance. But here in um, uh, Amsterdam, there's the green pea urinal where guys go for a pea and they grow marijuana plants. So I think only in Amsterdam. Um, and then there is the um, uh, kind of complete I, um, notion of how might we actually start a city based on these microbial technologies. So can we get completely off um, grid lifestyle? So for example, uh, the Gates Foundation is looking at powering um, uh, displaced people and, and, and settlements for refugees of up to about 30,000 people using these kinds of microbial technologies. So in a, in a sense, that's like a little mini city um, and it produces light, it uh, provides cleaned water, you still have to boil it, um, and it provides sanitation. So they are fundamental technologies of livability. So we may be able to uh, create off-grid environments, which might lead to the idea of more nomadic um, settlements and life. So if we're thinking of lots of people being displaced from climate change and issues to do with their resettlement, maybe when we don't have to be on grid for our sewage and lighting and, and energy, then maybe actually more nomadic uh, cultures become possible. So that's a real um, kind of, uh, let's say, look forward to the future, you know, uh, a different kind of symbiosis with the, let's say, the non-human landscapes around us. How might we make them visible? How might we start to engage them? Um, and um, essentially that's really been the, um, the, the exploration that I've been involved in in the last uh, yeah, five years or so. Um, and, um, you know, again, looking forward to, to scaling, but looking at the relationship between the body, space, um, and the more than human realm. So that's, I think, the end of my presentation. Just a couple of Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, wonderful presentation uh, and totally out of scale, which is uh, pretty amazing. Our next and last uh, presentation is by Francis Vitonti. Francis is going to uh, discuss algorithms, teaching algorithms. Francis is a pioneer of generative design. Uh, he used computational techniques to find new solutions for design and in engineering problems. He's the author of uh, 3D printing design, additive manufacturing, and the materials revolution. His work has been uh, widely published and collected by prestigious institutions such as the Smithsonian, Cooper Hewitt, the Vitra, and the Pompidou Center. Welcome, uh, Francis, and thank you for joining us. Oh, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's really nice to be here. Let me uh, share my screen. Oh. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so look, I, I'd, I'd like to, to start with this, um, with this video here to just, just set the, set the stage, set the, set the tone. Um, you know, what, what you're, what you're seeing play out is, uh, let's call the cellular automata. Um, I'm sure probably many of you are, are familiar with this. I mean, these are, these are systems that I think they captured my imagination, you know, very, very early in my career. And, uh, the way that they work, um, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's sort of, it's created this consistent theme and, and narrative thread, uh, to how I've, you know, really approached a, a set of pretty diverse problems, um, the various aspects of my career. Um, what I'm what we're here to talk about today, um, you know, I think from the introduction, my background is uh, originally it was in computer graphics. I, I have a degree in architecture. Um, currently, I'm a one of the co-founder and a, a CEO of a synthetic data company, and uh, I'm going to walk you through, I guess, this this journey and, and sort of how how we got there because they they seem like they might be disconnected. Um, but look, as you're as you're watching this play out, I think. You know, pay attention to the diversity, right? Uh, the diversity of forms and shape and, and morphology that's that's emerging from, you know, sets of really very simple interactions. Um, you know, what, what's going on in the system is you you've got um, effectively just let me jump ahead here. Oh, there was something. Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> um, you know. You've effectively got very, very simple, basic rules that are playing out, and they're they're producing a lot of diversity and, and a lot of complexity. Um, and and you know what what's going on here is really nothing more complex than what you have on the left hand of the screen, right? You have, you have local conditions that emerge, and then something else happens. Um, and you know I've always kind of thought of computation in this way as as, as being something that could always provide an, an an organizing logic or, or some kind of governing principle on which we could we could build um, products, uh, design cities. Um, you know, in this case, train train AIs that we'll get into. Um, I'm going to start off and just talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done at Studio Batanti, um, which I I founded and ran for, for eight years. Um, and the the objective at Studio Batanti was was really to see if we could use these systems um, to to to, to basically, you know, I guess for maybe get try to get computers to replace designers. Really, if, I, if I'm really being blunt about it, um, and, and what we were doing was like exploring these computational spaces, and and getting them to to design to design pro products. And in some cases, those algorithms are you know really incredibly present as they are here. Um, there may be a direct imprint, or maybe they're they're not so present. But what you see is that they they kind of they're used to to sort of organize um organize material or organize the way that you know the, the material is formed um and come up with novel shapes that that maybe you know challenge challenge our idea of what of what these products or what these categories um could be um and you know i think ultimately what 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 it came to be about for me was what i realized is so much of what design is is it's about organizing um you know, it, it's about it's about exploring a possibility space, right? I mean, I think we've, you know, we we, we see that with with some of the other presentations and designers. It's about it's about almost kind of setting up these parameters and and letting them play out and, and see what you could have. And I found that so much of the work as a designer was about like in in a lot of ways a, a search a search for novelty um, through these spaces. And you know what we were doing, and I didn't probably realize it at the time. But you know, in AI, we call this a, a latent space. Um, you know, it, these are this is a kind of a space of possibilities that's set up by by an algorithm. Um, so I'm going to walk through a, a project here where you know we were using a computational process, and we were letting that process be governed by by simulation. Um, and effectively, you know, what we were doing was we were adding or, or removing material based on some of the results in that simulation. Um, the, the, the product was a, a scoliosis brace. Um, we were, we were working with a, a startup company, um, that was, that was looking to 
you know, kind of redefine how you create these scoliosis braces. They've, they've been history, you know, scoliosis is a condition where you have a curvature of the spine. Um, you know, it, they're typically very big, they're very bulky, um, they're made by hand. Um, it's not really a, an industrialized process. Um, and they look very much like how this started. And what we were doing was like through iterative processes and, and kind of in hand in hand with these, with these methods of, of controlling the geometry, we were able to come at, at like a very new and, and novel novel design. Um, you know, it was exciting that that actually ended up getting acquired by the, the Cooper Hewitt and the Smithsonian there. Um, it's just a, a close up of that of the results. Um, so, you know, I think as, as we kind of went went through this this journey and, and this work, um, you know, I think I became increasingly more interested in what the algorithms were doing and what the computation was doing. And I think for me, it was always what was happening in those systems, you know, whether we were creating a shoe or creating it, you know, it was always the, the patterns of output or really ultimately what became data that these algorithms were outputting really became the lifeblood of what, of what we were doing. Um, and, and, you know, really the, the question and, and the interest in AI for me became, well, like, how do we, how do we create this leap, right? I mean, what we what we were doing was we were setting up these kind of computational games, and we were exploring these really complex possibility spaces. But like, how how could we actually start to get um, the AI to, to do get a computer to actually do some of these things without having to be so involved in the curation process? Um, what what you're looking at here is a it, it's a it's a deep neural network, and and what it's it's learning to it's learning to write numbers, right, is what, is what you're watching. So you're watching this as it's, it's training iteratively and it's going from really just producing a lot of random noise uh, to, to ultimately, as you see, as this plays out, it'll start to draw really clear representations of the digits. And I think for me, this, this type of work was a real aha moment when I discovered it. Um, what, what I noticed was I, I had spent all my time trying to build systems to, to kind of manage and shape incredibly complex parameter spaces uh, into into products, but really, you know, artificial intelligence was really the perfect is the perfect tool for this, um, right? And as, as you see, it'll it'll start to draw these really kind of um, you know. Let's see if we how long is this? We might we might fast forward just a little bit. All right, so as we get you know further through, we're starting to get to very kind of recognizable integers and, and digits. And you know, if you look, we're, we were starting really at something that was very far from you know understandable as, as a person. Um, so we you know we we founded Lexet, um, and what the goal with Lexet was one of the things we realized we were we were approaching AI. It's actually the, the first presentation um, really very elegantly outlined was that. Um, accumulating these data sets um, was incredibly difficult. Um, and, and I think because it was so difficult, we were forced to take um, a lot of sloppy and, and careless paths to acquiring those data sets, which actually even made our work e even harder. Um, you know, I, so this is, this is a breakdown from Cloud Factory of the, the time and cost uh, of, an AI, of an AI project and where, and where that's distributed. Um, the thing that stands out right away is, is look, 80% of this is, it has to do with tasks around data, right? Um, there, there's really, you know, very, very little of this is, you know, the model tuning, the training, developing the algorithm. Um, really, we're, we're kind of the big cost centers from, from a business perspective right now are, are in the, the data aggregation, identification of data, the cleansing, the labeling. And labeling by itself has become a multi-billion dollar industry, just trying to label unstructured data. Um, and then ultimately the, the, the data augmentation. So, um, you know, the, the, this is the really the, the problem that we were trying to address as a company was like, could we build a, a simulation tool, uh, a purpose built tool to allow artificial intelligence engineers to explore these possibility spaces and, and use them to train, to train their algorithms. Um, just to reiterate, I mean, uh, look, our, our, you know, we're, we're, we're a commercial company. So like for, for us, what, what's really important is that our customers are getting they're getting to do what what they do best and what's really happening is like i said they're they're just they're spending all their time on the top of this funnel and they're not getting to do the things that 
that they're getting paid to do, right? Which is which is take take these artificial intelligence systems, embed them in products, train and refine these algorithms. I mean, it, you know, I've actually heard stories of people, you know, driving around the country collecting photographs to get data sets, right? It's not necessarily the best use of someone's time when they're developing one of these algorithms. Um, so, you know, look, a, a brief history on this and, and we can kind of help contextualize what we're doing at Lexat. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really all, it's, it's fairly recent in, in history that we're able to really use these systems and, and use these algorithms. We just recently got enough computational power. Um, you know, I think the technology has been around for a while, but it's only really kind of risen to, to the, the public eye and, and, and the kind of mass adoption we're seeing now recently. And, and like I said, I think some of these early attempts, they're, they're kind of clumsy and it's what we can do best, right? And what we're seeing is a lot of kind of scraped data from the internet. We're, we're just kind of getting these, particularly in visual data sets, which is what we focus on. You're getting a lot of this unstructured visual data from, from pretty much anywhere you can. And then what's, what's emerged is, as I said, is this, you know, quite a large industry of, of taking that unstructured visual data, which, you know, is captured from the real world does have bias does have a, a number of privacy issues and concerns all the all the kind of things the, the kind of horror stories you see of ai it, it really begins here um and then they they go through and they provide structure to that data and it's returned and they can train their algorithms um even more recently you know we've started to see what, what's called synthetic data solutions um, and most recently we're starting to see synthetic data be adopted and used more widely in training computer vision visual algorithms um, some of the problems that we've identified with with synthetic data and what we're out to solve is that um, it, a lot of the processes used to collect and create these data sets they're not particularly scalable right they're they're still reliant on on teams of human beings that are kind of creating little bespoke video games or you know maybe even kind of like running like a bit like an animation studio um, it's it's not creating a really robust and parameterized representation of the world and that therefore makes it very difficult for the, the engineer to actually have a model of, of the world that they can tweak and manipulate as they refine their model and that's and that's really kind of at, at, at the root of it that's what our, our mission is at lexa is to create something that is kind of malleable enough so that an engineer can actually go through and have a purpose-built tool where they can build up simulations that are relevant to the problem that they're try trying to solve address any issues of bias or data acquisition that they're having and be able to iterate on the simulation while they're iterating on their model and create really seamless feedback loops between between those two things. Um, and, I, and I always like to kind of describe this or compare it to a you know, flight simulator, right? Like we do this with people. We, we train people in simulations um, all the time. We, we build these physically accurate environments and we learn new skills. Um, and really what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to do that for, for AI and for algorithms. So this is a, a sample of, of something that would come from our, our system. Um, we've, we've built a, a powerful procedural engine. Um, we've amassed a, a very large um, database of 3D objects that someone would find in the real world. Um, and we have a, a very deep semantic understanding of what these objects are made out of and what they're composed of. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to very rapidly build these procedural environments um, and allow our users to get access to these data sets with these annotations very, very quickly. Um, we're very dedicated to photorealism. Um, this is a, a demo, so it's a little bit more kind of abstracted than we would normally make them, but um, physical accuracy is a very important thing. And, and that's a, a been a big focus of our team is, is trying to close, I think, what is, what is often called the domain gap. Um, these are some other examples of data coming from our system. And right now, what we're very focused on is the, the built environment. Um, we're focused on spaces, creating spatial data sets. Um, we've been working both kind of inside and outside that built environment. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you'll see here we're producing highly detailed semantic maps. And then even, you know, what's very powerful about this is we're also producing some, some annotations that, uh, you know, it would be difficult to do with humans, right? Um, thinking about uh, three-dimensional data sets that like, you know, what would you have to 3D scan the entire world? So can we open up access to, to new classes of data that would, would otherwise not be accessible without tools like this? Um, 
the way that we we work with people is, is like I said, we've we've aggregated a, a huge um, kind of kind of content library of, of ourselves, which is which is semantically labeled and intelligent and it helps us compose these procedural scenes. We also allow our customers to kind of bring their own 3D content to the party, so to speak. Um, and then we have a set of APIs that allow them to describe the environment that they're that they're interested in. So I'm looking for daytime environments in living rooms or bathrooms. I'm looking for factories at nighttime. Um, and we can take that information from the user, uh, run many, many parallel simulations, and then send the resulting data sets um, to the customer. So I actually have to apologize. That went so much faster than I thought it would. <laughs> but I think it might be good for people to get some time back. Okay, thank you so much, Francis. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I think that uh, the, the four presentations, uh, I think that they went really incredibly, uh, not only diverse, but kind of like related in, in, times of, in terms of pairs. So I'm very uh, satisfied, not only for the level of the presentations, but also the engagement with the uh, difficult themes that we gave our presenters, which is uh, the correlation on crisis that we are, uh, living in. Uh, I would like to, because some, some of our guest uh, speakers um, are in Europe and it's very, very late for them. So I would like to start uh, perhaps addressing uh, a question uh, as part of the moderation before we open up the questions to the public. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh, to Akim and uh, uh, Constantinos, and then Tom is going to ask a, a couple of questions to uh, Rachel and Francis. So um, let me first ask uh, Akim, I think that you presented in a very synthetic way and wonderfully uh, the problem that we have today in architecture, which is the uh, unbalance, if you want, between expression and efficiency. And um, I would like to, to ask you um, in relationship to, for instance, to me, uh, one of the problems that we are living in is that the aesthetic values that we judge our architecture perhaps are most more based on uh, ideas of the market, on ideas of capitalism, ideas of excess, and perhaps not much related to uh, other questions, such as the questions that you, Akim, brought up, which is how to learn from the efficiency of uh, live uh, uh, organisms, how to learn about efficiency in terms of uh, 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 inhabitation, but also you bring up uh, issues in terms of um, not only uh, new aesthetic values, but new ethical values or the relationship between aesthetics and, and ethics. And uh, in that sense, I wonder, uh, and perhaps this is a, a twofold question, how you see uh, the relationship to anthropocentric references? So for instance, you're working with robotic arms and that brings to me the arm even and the movement is an anthropocentric uh, relationship between robotics and uh, how we understand material systems. How do you see uh, the new aesthetic barriers in terms of how you're pointing out efficiency relative to how we are thinking our reality and how we are innovating in robotic systems in relationship to that? If you can perhaps elaborate, because I know that you're working on new robotic systems and I wonder if you can say something about uh, that problem, right, between anthropocentric related issues and new types of aesthetics that are upcoming. Okay, uh, thanks for the question, um, which I think was a couple of questions uh, actually at once. So maybe um, I'll start with the last one because I think that's easier to answer uh, about the new robotic systems. I think the, the industrial robot in and of itself is basically um, a manifestation of exactly the approach that we try to critique. Um, uh, it's called the industrial arm because it was meant initially when it was introduced uh, in the 1960s as the replacement for the human arm, um, uh, literally the human worker on the assembly line. Um, so I think it's a kind of default response um, to new technical possibilities that we use them to mimic old approaches. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is an example from, let's say, uh, mechatronics. And an example in material technology would be that the first iron bridges actually mimicked timber bridges in detail in all their kind of articulation tectonics and uh, 
because there is a kind of lack of, I would say, maybe imagination or exploration of how you really tap into the full potential of these new technologies. And I think that's exactly the moment that we're witnessing with digital technologies at the moment, at, uh, uh, at this very moment. So I think um, what is interesting, and this maybe brings me to your, uh, so in terms of the robotic systems, um, we are now looking um, increasingly into, I think it's, it's clear that the first wave is the sort of automation of existing machines. And we are looking also into construction machines. And uh, of course, uh, because the hardware is, uh, is an equally challenging part to engineer, uh, it's not a bad starting point. But I think what we, what we are parallel working on parallel is actually very, very different machines that also have very different economics. So instead, uh, instead of having one tower grain that costs 400,000 euros, defining all your construction management, having uh, maybe a thousand robots that cost $400 and uh, can work in highly parallel fashion. Um, so that's something we are currently exploring in the kind of research field of on distributed robotics, which of course brings all kinds of, of challenges also for the actual robotics domain. Um, but I think it's interesting because it directly relates to um, the question about efficiency and effectiveness. And um, uh, what I learned from my conversations with biologists, for example, is that they don't know that they, they 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 don't think biological systems are efficient, but they're effective. And uh, I think uh, one uh, guy in economics once said. Uh, Efficiency means that you um, do things right and uh, effectiveness if you do the right things. Um, so it's a big difference, actually. Um, uh, so I think if you really want to um, look at effective systems, um, I think it's, uh, 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 I think that they, you probably have to learn how to read them, how to appreciate for example, that effectiveness and robustness goes very well together, at least if you look at biological systems, and that they really challenge our understanding of simplicity or com complexity. You know? I think that's that's the main lesson. Um, and uh, with that, they challenge also our understanding of economics. So if we don't look at economics just from a financial point of view, but from the burden on the environment, for example, um, of course, the way we uh, we design our buildings and we construct them is uh, it's mind mind boggling. No? So we actually, I mean, the whole idea of construction, uh, the idea of a brick wall is based on the on on excess. No, sort of the brick at the bottom of the wall is the same as the brick at the top of the wall, and probably um, uh, has to uh, in the end uh, uh, um, basically take a, a hundreds of the load. Um, same applies for. Uh, uh, sort of uh, the way we think about concrete as an amorphous material that we just fill up volumes um, to generate uh, the structure space. So I think it's it's very, very, very deeply rooted in our discipline, um, our conceptualization of um, mass and void and uh, how we conceptualize materials, how we prioritize geometry that is an I would say an indicator also to a very anthropocentric actually way of looking at the problem that we're trying to solve, which is, I think, a, a, um, a human centered uh, approach that we need to overcome no? because we know that we can only exist in an ecosystem of uh, multiple cultures and we need to basically also forge these more than human collaborate a sort of uh, uh, ecosystems, I would say, uh, if we want to have future. So I think it's a, it's a very multifaceted uh, question. Maybe it's a bit too late for me to give a more coherent answer than what I, <laughs> what I just proposed. But I think um, um, we can, I think that the interesting thing about looking into biology is that it triggers, uh, I think um, for me, the most interesting is thing is that it triggers scientific lateral thinking. Yeah. So you, you, it means that you can really think differently, but you don't lack uh, a sense of rigor in doing so. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, 
one of the the issues that uh, and perhaps now I, I because we are running a little bit uh, out of time in relationship to our original planning so I, I really appreciate your answer and I and I completely agree with what you're saying in terms of uh, the distributed robotics or the problems of success that we are uh, we need to reconsider in terms of how we even conceive architecture so I am very happy that we're having this conversation because usually the um, Robotic construction is often seen as a technical problem that has nothing to do with ethics or philosophy or, or even a conceptualization of architecture. And I think that that's exactly what we need to intervene, uh, even at the data generation level, right? Like how we are uh, not only creating more efficient system, but we also look for a different type of uh, economics in terms of uh, architecture, such as what you're saying because the aesthetic values are a kind of a driven for a driver for us, right? So in that sense, we need to look for that. But thank you, Akim, for joining us. I know that it's very late for you. Uh, so we appreciate your time. And um, uh, I, unless you have a, a, a final comment, I'm going to jump into the next uh, question because what you mentioned actually brings me to uh, Constantinos. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure. But if you don't mind, I'm, I'm dropping out now. <laughs> yes, no problem. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So uh, this is, the next question is con to Konstantinos and is uh, uh, in continuity with what we just discussed with Akim, right? Uh, how are we, because Konstantinos, you, you were very, uh, I'm actually extremely excited that you were able to join us because I met you a couple of years ago in a conference that you did in London. And to me, it opened up a very different way of thinking about AI, uh, and we need that in architecture, uh, not only in order to guide ourselves in order what to do next, but also not to just simply apply new technologies uh, as tools, but actually rethink those technologies in relationship to what architecture is supposed to do. You brought up uh, uh, an issue about um, classification categories that, uh, uh, that they become recursive in terms of how you identify AI problems. And I give you, I'm not sure if you, uh, and because I remember your presentation in relationship to self-driving cars and what you show about the stop sign and you went directly to a very detailed way of how to trick, uh, trick the system. But before then, uh, one of the issues of semantic uh, segmentation, right, in 3D scanning is uh, how you create the categories, right, to identify and to produce the machine learning mechanism to start uh, uh, optimizing itself. And I wonder, you know, in architecture, for instance, I'm working with um, Baroque three, uh, buildings, 3D scanning, in which the relation between what's supposed to be a door and what's supposed to be a window is totally blurred. Like there's no category because the architect is actually pushing the boundaries of categories be beyond uh, rationalization and even breaking boundaries between different disciplines, right? Between architecture, painting, uh, uh, spatial perception, and multidimensionality within the frescoes or perspective mixed with other type of reality. So I wonder if you can ex uh, expand a little bit more in terms of um, semantic segmentation relative to the problems that you were identifying. Yeah, so um, uh, that, that's a very interesting question. And uh, uh, of course, the, 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 the root of the question is that uh, uh, information is a multidimensional uh, is multidimensional, and uh, the moment we create categories that are understandable to humans, uh, we, we have to you know we have to throw some structure in there, and uh, the the structure that we're going to throw in there uh, is going to contain uh, biases, and it's also going to uh, incorporate uh, maybe blind spots that uh, we uh, humans have. Um, and, and, you know, the, the blind spots are, of course, related to biases and um, either uh, biases that uh, come from, say, evolution, like the, the way our brain is constructed, uh, um, or biases that come from our education or our culture. Uh, so, and, uh, of course, uh, the moment we put those labels in there and... Uh, we um, abstract away the learning task into uh, a classification problem, which asks the computer to uh, map uh, the multidimensional data into a label that uh, we constructed in some hierarchy of, of labels. 
uh, we are going to endow our systems with the, you know, the, those types of biases and, um, uh, you, know, by, you know, maybe, you know, like introduce blind spots to our own systems as well, right? Because, our, you know, the, mo the moment we present with, a, you know, our systems with a hierarchy of, of concepts, uh then uh, effectively we are biasing our systems to a system you know we, we we might bias our system to have blind spots as to potential relationships between uh two categories that are maybe far in our hierarchy of, of concepts thank you thank you so much um so uh the, the issue i mean when you mentioned briefly about it is when it becomes recursive and accelerated right which is the the problem of uh, social media and uh, you know related to politics and and how this uh, actually this uh, it becomes a learning uh, exponential problem right like the machine yeah. learns in the wrong way right and it becomes totally violent against uh, the own mechanisms of uh, social reproduction so in that sense to me the, the issue is how we deal with uh, self referential systems against non-referential systems right like uh, and i think that i remember you mentioned a little bit of that in your previous conference like one of the most advances uh, in ai is the fact that algorithms can train themselves instead of imitating neural activity for instance or the problematic relationship between uh, the brain form as you're saying in terms of evolution or the artificial constructions of humans in relationship to that so um, i think it's, you bring up very interesting interesting issues um, I don't know, Tom, if you want to continue or Konstantinos, if you want to uh, add anything else to, to the conversation. Maybe let me add another thing in, in, uh, inspired by what you just said. So uh, there are, um, uh, so kind of like, uh, you know, like endowing uh, bias, uh, endowing your AI systems with bias is a, a double edge, uh, uh, you know, consideration, right? So. Uh, if you make your system completely agnostic, uh, it uh, uh, you know th that is a technique that uh, in recent years has uh, given a lot of uh, lots of fruit. Uh, at the same time, it does not use data efficiently, and we have arrived at the point where we have realized that we cannot continue with that same paradigm, the completely agnostic paradigm. Uh, uh, you know, from from this point on. So just, and just to put it in a broader historical context, a lot of the development of, of AI uh, research uh, has had been before sort of like, uh, you know, the past 10 years before neural, deep neural networks became uh, a very successful technology. But before deep neural networks, uh, um, AI systems incorporated a lot of domain knowledge. So they incorporated all the domain knowledge that had been developed in different disciplines around different applications by humans. Uh, and that, uh, you know, arrived at the point of stagnancy. Now, the recent perspective was, you know, make your, collect a ton of data and make your system agnostic uh, and, you know, you know, have it translate between English and French by just showing it a lot of examples, not endowing it with any linguistic uh, structure. Uh, so, you know, and that gave a lot of fruit uh, in the past 10 years. But I think we are at the point of uh, sort of like, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk of introspection, where we have also figured out the limits of that agnostic technology. And I think we are at the point where we have to merge the two perspectives. We need, we are at the point where we need to use domain understanding uh, to, uh, you know, give structure to our learning systems uh, without hopefully biasing them uh, too much. Okay, so. Well, maybe I'll jump in here. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank you all, and I guess in retrospect or later on as well to, to Achim, for all your presentations. Uh, they're diverse, engaging, uh, very much world leading in each of these very diverse areas of, of, uh, of work. And uh, one commonality in the breadth of what has been presented today in the four presentations is, um, uh, I guess, our, our shared global health context, which each of you made reference to. Uh, as a consequence of our current pandemic, uh, an area of 
heightened consciousness amongst the design community has arisen. Uh, as designers, I mean, I know not all of us are designers here, Konstantinos, um, we do have an onus to consider the risks uh, of what uh, Rachel Armstrong, you call the microbial scale in design, uh, design of interiors, of architecture, of transport and urban spaces. Um, and Rachel, I, I think among others, um, has researched this particulate invisible scale and the metabolism of inhabitable spaces in great detail long before the pandemic. Uh, and it'd be interesting to, to hear speculations on the further impact of this crisis uh, with respect to um, how and which ways in the longer term for the design disciplines, our interiors, our buildings, public spaces, cities, may be transformed by this ongoing health crisis. And if I can ask a really more pointed question, uh, in which ways does the health of our spaces and our bodies inhabiting those spaces depend upon the intersection uh, of our spaces with, with our design with data science, simulation, predictive systems, AI, uh, and other areas of computation? Maybe Rachel, if, if I could direct this to, to you first. Yeah, I, I, I thank you. I think that's an absolutely fascinating um, question. I, I, and I do want to say that within the living architecture um, uh, apparatus, there is an AI that's observing the electron flow. So uh, the short answer to your question is not enough. Um, that, uh, you know, notions of the, uh, of the exposome, which is the kind of broader realm of invisible agents, which includes, uh, you know, chemicals, um, particles and you know, kind of biological agents in our um, domestic spaces again is, is only just being explored. Um, and you know, things like sick building syndrome, but also chronic health effects, you know, from asthma and everything are all being linked, you know, particularly when in the modern environment um, we have a lot of artificial materials. So MDFs and you know, plastics are creating um, a toxic environments that we've actually not been measuring. And so our awareness of this kind of molecular activity is, is inviting uh, new ways of thinking about how we design space, particularly indoor space. Um, and I think the general principle right now is we want our indoor spaces to be more like nature, but work that's been done in the University of Oregon with people like Jessica Green, um, are kind of still trying to map and uh, interrogate what the landscapes that we're revealing actually mean, because we, we don't even know that yet. Um, so I, I think there's a there's a lot of data and a lot of information there, and that's I think exactly where you know the the AI, the softwares, these kinds of um, uh, let's call it. Um, but bio digital, I think, is is the word that I would use that um, uh, that kind of uh, interplay between what we would previously call the sustainable organic realm and then the informatic um, and uh, smart realm. I think I think these two worlds are coming into play and I think they have to I mean, we have to figure out how how is a how is a microbe actually a computer? And how do we actually start to read populations of those? Or how do we um, you know, create environments where um, we, we're no longer thinking about dead spaces and sterile um, uh, surfaces, but we're actually thinking about different layers of ecosystems and different scales. So I, I think there's a, an incredible um, uh, kind of collaboration to be had. I think it's a lot of uh, changing in thinking. Um, I think interface and fields, and I think we're going to ch change our language and ideas. So I think it's a very exciting time to be a young designer. <laughs> well, I, I can imagine as you know, someone as yourself that has been working on on this area of uh, of space for really so long. Uh, I, I think it's you know that awareness and and the the sea change that it takes to actually begin to act upon. Uh, the relationship between uh, the nature that still, of course, exists in all of our spaces uh, and for uh, our spaces to be, well, safe and healthy. Um, uh, can we afford to work through trial and error? Or, or in, and in which ways do, do, does experimentation today um, need to address, in, in a sense, a kind of much larger scale of uh, consequence? Uh, I think this conversation would be probably very different 
before the global pandemic, because we may be talking about um, uh, the scale of a domestic unit. Now the scale of a domestic unit is about 7 billion people living in them and not really being allowed to, to leave them. Yeah, I, I, this, this is, I, I think the experimentation prototyping is absolutely key. I think that we have to go through an era of experimental design, not just to see what happens for the hell of it. I think that Akim's kind of uh, position was really right, which was, you know, we have to we have to start to map ways of decentering human, kind of refocusing and and creating a more um, a dispersed or diffuse ways of designing and and responding to design. But I think I think there's some clues, and I think the thing that excites me is that actually there's a shared currency between the smart and the sustainable, let's say, and that's the electron. The electron is the currency of life. It's just that our machines work at uh, work with electrons. It's these kinds of, it's like a waterfall in a cup of water. You know, nature works with a cup of water and can work really strategically about moving electrons around and getting the uh, receiver molecules, let's call them ions for a second. So they're charged molecules and they'll accept or uh, throw off a charge and nature's really good at that because it changes the shape of a molecule. So in in a in a, an industrial sense, we've only, we we just we shove electrons through metal wires. So they they're like these clouds and rivers. Um, but um, you know nature works in a much more strategic way. And I think that we're starting to find kind of communication spaces when we reduce the power of computing and electronics, then I think that actually more of these kind of conversations between the two worlds become possible. So there is a common currency. Um, so that excites me. And I think that, that that's a, a really interesting landscape for exchange. And that's where I think the barometer for thinking about, well, what are the impacts here? I mean, what we're trying to do is really increase the currency of electron flow uh, in kind of multiple and diverse ways. And if we're doing that, maybe we call that fertility in an old uh, terminology, but you know, we're looking for new um, barometers. And I think, again, you know, the conversations that went earlier about different economics is absolutely it. Economics is about value and about how we make those transactions um, and the kind of care and attention that we pay to the design interventions that we're making. So I think that that, um, that space is the first space. You know, if, if, we, if we get an economics of design going um, and that's the currency of life, then that's actually quite interesting to, to use as the barometer of our success. So I, I still think it's a really exciting time. And I think I, you're absolutely right, Tom. I think these uh, presentations have absolutely been amazing, mind blowing. Well done for putting such a fantastic program together. <laughs> You know, we do live, as I say, in, in very interesting times, and I think that our, the design disciplines tend to thrive uh, on our responses to crisis. Uh, and uh, if anything, any, anybody who's involved in world making through as designers uh, inevitably um, must respond, and uh, there is really no choice. And I, I feel like we live in a time where um, the, the, the slogan and the book title that Ian McCard wrote maybe some 60 years ago, designing with nature or design with nature takes on a completely different meaning by now in terms of what we understand really as uh, nature and the, and the relationship between the biological and the mechanical. Um, I, we, our time is getting on, but I, I'd like to ask um, one other question and maybe then we, we may have time to open this up a little bit, um, which also has to do with the context uh, institutionally of launching our two new MS programs here uh, at New York Tech. Uh, and some may understand more ways in which these two specializations, design and health and computational technologies, uh, the ways in which these two specializations may differ more in their conceptual and technological apparatus um, of the respective foci of each of these two MS programs and the, the research arenas. Uh, and I'd like to open a discussion about the commonalities more so about the these specialized disciplinary areas um, and the way and the, the 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 ways that now or in the future um, they may share more particular uh, emphases. 
um, perhaps a question directed to Francis Patonti, um, that as a designer, uh, the methods that you do um, use to manage the workflows between analysis of particular health phenomenon, uh, phenomena and the, and the visualization through computer interfaces um, also serves as the working environment for generating material responses to uh, processes in, informed by computation. Uh, and in, in particular, how is information interfaced? How can it be you know, better interfaced? Uh, how is 3D print printing deployed at the, the leading edge? of the production of prosthetics. You've presented some of this, but maybe you could elaborate. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, particularly in that, in that device that we showed, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of data there. There's, there's the patient's data. Um, there's, there's also, you know, there, there's all this data that gets generated from the simulations we run to try to figure out the, the kind of appropriate amount of material. Um, and then, you know, these these systems themselves they're they're complex systems so they kind of they kind of unfold um, their own patterns and data and behavior all, all of which um, kind of needs to be filtered out I mean it, you know I think from a quite practical perspective um, you know I mean I think it's it's actually it's actually quite straightforward to manage all of that I mean I think we've we've got a lot of the, the technology there um, you know I think what what becomes interesting from, from our perspective is is like it, you know, a lot of these systems are, you know, they're designed for maintaining medical records. They're, they're designed for, you know, they, they have a, a kind of a, a different intent. Um, so, you know, I mean, I know something that we always run through is you're always kind of reshaping and, and, and reforming data as the, as the use cases change. And I think in the design process, the visual, the way in which you visualize it is very important, right? Because it, it, it kind of, it shows you things. Um, and, you know, very often, you know, like you're dealing with very high dimensional data. These aren't things that we have a kind of intuitive understanding of. So you're always kind of making these interpretations and you're making these leaps. Um, you know, it's, it's subjective. And I think it's, I think that's really where like the, the, the architecture backgrounds always come in for me because it's an act of it's an act of drawing in the end of the, at the end of the day and it becomes that that kind of exploration where you know how you're I mean that's you know when, when you're when you're working as an architect that's that's kind of that process right you're taking all these ideas all these thoughts all these kind of parameters that are multi-dimensional and you're, you're trying to find some kind of expression of it and, and I think it's it's kind of similar in, in a lot of ways although uh, maybe a, a little more kind of gears and rubber to the road than than it is in an architecture practice <laughs> You make it seem simple to kind of transfer high orders of information into material organization. I mean, this is, as you say, this is maybe what designers or architects have done forever is, is the transference of information into material form. It's uh, like, it's compression, right? I mean, you've got what, you might have, you know, 20,000 dimensions of information. I got to get it into three. <laughs> and then you end up with the materials. So. Uh, we can refer to the questions in the chat. The, quest the only problem is that there is, I think that there was one question for Akim and he left now. So uh, perhaps if somebody in the audience would like to uh, raise a question now. This may be an indication that we've got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's a little late, uh, but um, you know uh, th there was a question related to uh, robotics, and I feel like Akim is not here, so maybe we can skip it. But uh, I don't know if you if you would like to address uh, somebody. I don't know if I, I don't see the chat. I don't see any other questions uh, to the other uh, invited guests. No, I don't. I don't see any either in the in the chat. I, I was keeping note earlier but you know just maybe to round up uh one of uh, because it's getting late and we don't want to abuse uh the the you know the sharing of the time of our uh colleagues here in in europe uh i, I want to specifically uh, address how interesting it was to to look at the problems from different points of view and different perspectives and, uh, you know, all the way from mathematics with Constantino thinking about the problems of AI to me uh, has a value beyond uh, architecture, of course. 
but also thinking about um, uh, what are the issues that we need to apply and how, how we can apply them, how, what are the issues that we're looking for, and what are the ethical uh, understandings in order to think beyond our own limitations. And, uh, but I'm also interested in what Rachel said about um, a different way of relating the body with the space, right? Not to recognize the conventional boundaries, right? So there is a, there is a notion uh, not only of scale, uh, because of, of things that are not visible, as, as Tom mentioned, but also a different idea about what the envelope is, right? At the micro level, uh, there is no distinction between uh, boundaries, right? Uh, and, and I think that there is an interesting, uh, a lot of knowledge, very, very deep knowledge in this conversation uh, from what Constantinos uh, mentions about how we are eliminating data without even realizing, right? We are creating prototypes by eliminating amount of data, right? Which is something I, I, I never really thought about. I never uh, knew and I never read. So uh, the, not only the, the, the problem of uh, projecting categories, but also how we are accessing reality already part of the problem, right? Uh, and the new mechanisms, the new tools allow us to expand that way of looking at reality, but at the same time, they may also project that same reality. So that's one of the interesting things that we are trying to develop in the new programs. How can we represent reality, acknowledging that uh, problematic feedback, right? That the tool may also be projecting our own assumptions as well. Uh, but maybe um, unless there are any final comments, uh, Tom, perhaps we can uh, resume here. Um, I don't know if uh, there is any feedback from the speakers, if you want to say anything, just closing words. So if I may come back to one qu to the question that Tom asked earlier about the pandemic and what that means for, uh, you know, uh, um, machine learning and data collection. <clears throat> it's important to acknowledge that uh, what the pandemic, um, you know, motivates, and that's very closely related to what Rachel was talking about, uh, is the importance of having access to data that monitor uh, uh, our living, uh, uh, you know, our, our environment. And um, that is, uh, again, a double-edged sword, right? So on the one hand side, you know, collecting all this data could be used to prevent uh, future pandemics or constrain them better than what we managed to do this time around. At the same time, the important problem that it uh, brings up is uh, uh, the component of privacy. And um, uh, what I'm thinking is, you know, one question that you know arises in my head is, you know, and you know, of course, data is very useful. At the same at the same time, privacy is very useful. So, how is architecture gonna interact with these two opposing forces? On the one hand side, you know, the need to collect data. On the other side, to protect people's privacy. That is a, uh, you know, a, a Gordian knot almost. Uh, it's a hard problem to resolve. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that in in that sense, we we ourselves we're trying to uh, um, create our own data sets, and we encounter that problem. That on the one hand, we say why people are not sharing more, right? It's like a conflict of interest, right? And at the same time, you want people to re release uh, their cell phones to actually use as ways of logging reality so that you can access that. At the same time, there is privacy because if you don't know that that is happening, that's an issue. That's why I think blockchain technologies are, are, are producing a, a very interesting way of uh, addressing that by people releasing voluntarily their information and having data validation gates, right? that uh, allows you to have more control of that. But that's a very interesting uh, problem also. Yeah, Rachel, yeah. Um, I, I think it really raises, and I think it is relevant to the pandemic, the issue of immunity, um, both as a political um, condition, which is its origins, but also as the kind of the physical biological, which is negotiated space. So you're negotiating whether something is private or public. You're negotiating whether there is a tra transaction and you know the immune system that we know is incredibly complex. We still haven't kind of really figured out how it how it all works. But I think the system for making decisions um, or that the framework that might help us actually has been raised by the pandemic. And I think it is this question of immunity. Great comment. 
All right, maybe uh, Francis, you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to add. I mean, I think I don't know it, what I'm seeing kind of in, in industry is there's a, a probably a, a greater tendency towards towards privacy really than than there is towards sharing. Um, you know, I think a lot of the a lot of the requests that we see, especially the kind of the attraction of simulated data, is, is so they can get data without violating privacies and things of that sort. So it's yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm I'm seeing a pull in that direction and, and it's, it's, it's understandable, right? I mean, we're all, we're all kind of walking around with sensors tied to ourselves. So it, you know, it makes, it makes sense. We want to close the door sometimes. Well, the question is the internet of things, right? Like how that is going to work in terms of uh, activating sensors everywhere versus data privacy. And I think that there, uh, the population has to be more informed. And uh, we have to see, you know, there's so much to be discussed in that sense, but, uh, Tom, I don't know if you want to say just uh, something to close, but we should be uh, ending the conversation. I want to thank uh, again the presentations because to me they they brought a very interesting balance and contrast uh, that I, I was expecting, but I didn't realize it was going to work so well. So I really want to thank you how you engage with the problems that we drop in terms of the semester's uh, lecture series, uh, which uh, I think you took very seriously. So. I really appreciate that. Uh, so I want to thank you again. I would very much like to thank all, all four of you and I think who's left uh, for your wonderful, diverse, you know, inspiring presentations. Uh, to, to thank the, our, our Dean for her support, the Lectures and Events Committee for working together to make this event and many others happen, uh, and Pablo to uh, co-organize this together. It's been really a thrill and a pleasure to, to be here tonight with all of you. All right. Thank you very much and uh, have a good night and thank you again for joining us. Thank you.